Hi everyone, over to you Julie. Good morning everybody. Um, delighted you can join us for track two. Uh, we're going to be talking about turbocharging creativity this morning. Um, Danny Fontaine is joining us from IBM. Uh, my name is Julie Marshall. I'm the founder of uh, Join Up the Dots, a consultancy helping marketing agencies to improve their relationships with brands and customers by joining up their marketing and their sales and um, hopefully showcasing uh, their capabilities and uh, the way they can add value. So I'm delighted today to particularly to be here um, with Danny Fontaine. He heads up uh, the uh, experiential selling team at IBM. Hi, Danny. How are you doing? And um, he is actually his team very much around pulling together emotion um, and uh, the uh, uh, sorry, emotion and um, so psychology and storytelling to really pull together um, magical pitches. Um, and I'd be delighted if someone called one of my pitches uh, magical as well. So I'm looking forward to this session very much. So. Um, uh, before handing over to Danny, I will just say, please put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll be having a little bit of a Q&A session at the end. So, uh, Danny, um, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Julie. Hopefully you can hear me OK, just to check before I start. I can hear you fine. Hopefully everybody Fantastic. else can too. Lovely. OK, so did you ever wonder what makes one person more creative than another? Did you ever wish that you could be more creative than you are. My name is Danny and I work at IBM as a creative director where I'm expected to come up with new ways of wowing an audience on a daily basis and so is my team. And maybe you're familiar with that type of pressure yourself. It can actually be quite stressful, which in turn makes coming up with new ideas even more difficult. But there is another way. And today I'm going to show you some methods and techniques that will enable anyone to turbocharge their creativity. But first of all, what is creativity? And is anyone born creative? Well, the dictionary defines creativity as the use of skill and imagination to produce something new or to produce art. And so essentially, it's the ability of someone to come up with new ideas, which can leave some people terrified. But let's get two things crystal clear from the beginning. Number one, according to science, no one is born creative. Now this in turn means that anyone can be creative. But then what makes one person seemingly able to come up with a hundred new ideas, whilst another might be staring at a blank sheet of paper. Well, there's an incredible amount of research and study on this topic. And most scientists agree that their level of creativity is influenced by a wide a range of factors that mostly stem from our life experience. For example, our exposure to music and the arts, whether we've suffered from trauma or conflict within our lives, our financial situations, our education, our political beliefs, the physical environment around us. Now the list goes on and on. But importantly, this means that no matter how creative you think you are, from this point forth, we can increase our exposure to the things that influence our creativity. You can immerse yourself in culture and art and surround yourself with creative people in creative spaces because we need exposure to creativity to become more creative because it can be absorbed like osmosis directly into our bodies and it is of course contagious as well but as well as just exposure there are techniques and methods that we can use to turbocharge creativity. Firstly, divergent thinking. This is the practice of unconstrained ideation around many potential solutions. There are no limits. There are no wrong ideas. Instead, we push ourselves to the boundaries of absurdity. We use associations and intuitions to just let our brains just flow. And the benefits are vast. The most absurd ideas 
can often lead to the right solution. And a chain of associated ideas can often be the catalyst for new innovation. Let me tell you a story. There is an energy company in the United States called Pacific Power. And in the Pacific Northwest, where they have a vast number of power lines, they also get heavy snow in the autumn and in the spring, which results in a buildup of ice on the lines, which if it isn't removed, it will break the power lines, cutting off electricity and costing the company a huge amount of money in repairs and loss of revenue. Now, this story dates back to the late 1980s when health and safety wasn't quite what it is today. And the solution at the time was a logical one. We'll get employees called linemen to climb up the icy poles with a giant hook and shake the ice off the electric wires. Now, unsurprisingly, the linemen were not actually very fond of this activity and a great many of them were actually injured doing it. And so the company's brightest minds tried to come up with a better solution, but with no results. And so in a final attempt to find that one innovative idea, they organized a session with all employees from all areas of the business, the linemen, the supervisors, the accountants, the people in the mailroom. And during one of these sessions, there were two. One of the linemen was discussing his pure dislike for the job and recounted a story about not only was it cold and icy and terrible and surrounded by electricity, but when I got to the bottom of the pole, I was confronted with a giant bear. The bear was apparently somewhat annoyed at her territory being invaded and proceeded to chase the man for over a mile in the snow. But someone in the session then had an idea. Why don't we train bears to climb the poles? They're so heavy that by climbing, they'd probably shake the ice off. A second person suggested that instead of training the bears, which admittedly could be difficult for a power company, why not put a pot of honey on top of the poles so that the bears would climb up to reach it, thus shaking the ice free in the process? Good point, said another person. Uh, but if we used a helicopter, we could fly over and drop honey on poles in the ice storm. So the linemen don't have to keep replenishing the, the honey at the top. Now, up until this point, each of the ideas had been laughed at in turn. But now a final voice piped up. She said, I was a nurse's aide in Vietnam and I have seen hundreds of helicopters landing and taking off and they create an immense dust storm from their propeller blades. Perhaps if we just flew helicopters over the lines, that might be enough to get rid of the ice. And there was no laughter this time. They would found the answer and Pacific Power used this technique to this very day. Now, the key thing is, if there was no divergent thinking, if there was no bear, then there'd be no honey and there would be no helicopter. And the good news is these days there are a million frameworks, tools and games to facilitate divergent thinking. I don't have time now, so please just Google exercises for divergent thinking and try some of them out. And when you do, you want to be pushing the boundaries to the absurd to see where you end up. And don't forget to invite participation from people outside of your personal network. Okay, number three, subconscious thinking. Another catalyst for creativity is complete disassociation. So in its simplest form, I'm talking about taking time away from your tasks and either doing absolutely nothing or doing something entirely different. Because our subconscious brain is an extremely powerful tool, but it only works if we give it the space to wander and do its own thing. And of course, that's not possible when we're constantly tunnel vision focusing on a task. And I'm sure that this might be familiar to you. Do you ever take a shower or, or go for a run and find that it's in these moments that our best ideas just pop into our brains? So to have more ideas, we simply need to create 
more space for this to happen. The simplest way of doing this is to take breaks from work, exercise more or take more showers, as it were. But there is an even more powerful way of interacting with our subconscious, and that is to fall asleep. Well, nearly. OK, so one of the most famous advocates of nearly falling asleep as a technique for creativity is prolific inventor Thomas Edison. Here you can see him taking a nap in front of the President of the United States, Warren G. Harding. Now, Edison invented many things, including the gramophone, the light bulb, the movie camera. He's a highly creative person by definition, but he also hated sleeping. He thought it was a complete waste of time, but he did realize the potential for using it to generate ideas. So much so that he used to take frequent naps, laid back in a comfy armchair with metal ball bearings clenched in his fists. And the story goes that when he first dropped off to sleep, his fists would become unclenched and he would drop the ball bearings, resulting in a very loud noise that would then wake him up. And he'd immediately write down whatever ideas he had or whatever he could remember from that state. And this is scientific, a, a study published very recently, actually, in Science Advances. You can Google it, find the details of the experiment if you're interested. But they have confirmed that we have a brief period of creativity and insight in the semi-lucid state that occurs just as we begin to drift into sleep. A sleep phase called N1, or non-rapid eye movement sleep stage one. And this is a golden mind state where our brains solve problems, concoct new ideas and create brilliance without us having to do anything other than creating the space for it to happen. And here you can see uh, another one of my favorites, Salvador Dali, who uh, was an N1 enthusiast. And so tip number three, take time away from your tasks and that will actually increase your productivity and creativity. Allow your subconscious to do the heavy lifting. Find a way to get into the N1 state that works for you. And of course, don't forget to force yourself to record the things that you find there. Okay, next, experimentation and play. Some of the greatest masterpieces ever created were done through experimentation and play by creators who set out on a journey without knowing where it was going to take them. They are following a need to satisfy their curiosity or a desire to try something new and unfamiliar. Damien Hurst preserved animals in formaldehyde. Jackson Pollock swung from a ceiling in a harness and Salvador Dali sought to paint the world that was inside of his mind. And of course, venturing into an experimental unknown does not guarantee final results, but the key takeaway is that we learn from the journey. We find things that don't work and some unexpected things that do, and we grow. But the problem with creativity in a corporate environment is that this space for experimentation and play is rarely part of our processes. We receive a brief, we get given a deadline, we have a limited budget. And within that kind of iron triangle, there is no room for play and very little room for mistakes. And this, in my opinion, is an ironic situation. We are the creatives. We are the ones who people call when they need an innovative solution. But the only time we get to be creative is when we're working on someone else's briefs and deadlines. Now, fairly recently, I read a book called Loon Shots by Safi Vachal, which discusses this topic at length and inserts, uh, asserts that we must build in time for experimentation and play into our processes. And so we gave it a go at IBM. We decided to form a mini squad of three people each week, which is about 10% of the team. Now, this Loon Shot squad has a new brief that they agree on together and their remit is to experiment and to play and to create 
and we look at technologies like augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, the metaverse. We look at techniques like animation or 3D modeling. We try out new software and we also push standard software to the limit. For example, we had a surprisingly awesome sprint with Loon Shots, seeing how far we could push the limits of PowerPoint. And it's amazing how far you can actually go. And here's the important bit. At the end of the sprint, we have had fun at work. We've also been let off any creative leash to experiment. And we have learned and we play back as well so that everyone has that learning. And we publish our work on an internal site to inspire anyone who wants ideas. And we have grown our toolkit and our repository of creative options. And the economics of this are sound as well. Think about it. The usual way of doing things, uh, a brief comes in with a deadline and a budget. We rush to get to a solution without considering all of the potential options. And if we do consider something totally new and uncharted, then because of the steep learning curve, the risk is often too high to try and achieve it. And if we do try something new, we just have such little room for mistakes, which means we tend to cover up any mistakes instead of learning from them. With the Loon Shot Squad, 10% of capacity is spent constantly building up capabilities and ideas that are ready to be deployed. And when a new opportunity comes in, we have a wealth of inspiration and our choice in our, in our creative repository. And should we choose one of those ideas, we're ready to build on a foundation of skill that we have already created and at very low risk. And so give it a go. Try creating a loon shot squad. You only need one person and you could just have one person for one day. It doesn't matter. It's finding the time to put play and experimenting into your daily process. Experiment in the unknown and importantly, record your outcomes and share them with others, especially the mistakes and the learning that you get from them. All righty, number five, inspiration is everywhere. So in 2019, I was asked to facilitate a workshop for one of the biggest department stores in Europe. Now it's confidential, but for the sake of this story, we'll call them Retailer X. And the major challenge we faced with Retailer X was the mindset of their senior leadership. They wanted to provide unique cutting edge experiences for their customers, but they were paralyzed by that risk of failure uh, and a culture of bureaucracy and silos. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with those kinds of environments. And whenever we brought new ideas to them, they would say things like, well, we can't do that because our legacy systems won't support it, or it's great for others, but it's not great for us. And so we needed a paradigm shift and we came up with an exciting idea. For one day only, we decided to give all of these employees a new job at an entirely fictional competitor, similar in every way to Retailer X, and we called it Brompton Place. And the theory was that if we could make it feel real, then they would ideate and innovate without constraints. And so before the workshop, we prepared the studio with some big uh, A0 foam boards on easels uh, emblazoned with the logos and color of Retailer X. We even have flower arrangements in the colors of Retailer X as well. And then to start with, I put a slide up on the big screen called Why Retailer X Need IBM Products to Succeed. Now, this is exactly what they didn't want to hear. It was provocative. It was put there to, to wake up their basic croc brains, their human instincts. And I began to talk over this slide. And I am now going to attempt to recreate exactly what happened right here, right now, just for you. <clears throat> so I'm gonna tell you why retailer X needs it. Oh. Terribly sorry, this is a bit embarrassing. 
my colleague Vera is calling me. I need to just pick this up. Sorry. Oh, about hi, that. Danny. How are you? Hi, Vera. I'm good. I'm kind of in the middle of something at the minute, though. I know. I know. I know you're with the lovely people. At Retailer X. Something super important I need to talk to you about. All right, but make it quick, yeah? Okay. So listen, I had a dream. You're calling me about a dream. I am calling you about a dream, but it was a super important dream. So last night, I was the owner of a luxury department store in Knightsbridge. Now, it was amazing, absolutely fantastic. People came from all over the world, and we were eventually London's number one tourist destination. Wow, that's great. I know, it was pretty great. Um, so guess what? What? Well, this morning, I woke up, made a couple of calls to some friends of mine that have some money, and I bought a space in Knightsbridge. What? Are you oh, sure yeah. you know what you're doing? Well, no, is the honest answer to that, which is why I've called you. I'm going to need your help. So we're working with a million square feet. I don't exactly know how to make a big space like that super profitable. So this is where you step in. Okay, well, go on. Well, it's called Brompton Place. So I've already named it. You're welcome. Uh, and it opens in a month. And the good news is I've managed to secure double salaries for all of the lovely people you're with. Mm, so those retailer folks eggs. that are sitting in the room right now get to come with us. You all work for me now. This is a bold move. I think go big or go home, right? I even took the liberty of designing a logo. So if you flip those boards off over there, you will see my infinite wisdom. Okay, so at this point, we flipped the Retailer X boards and we spun, spun the flower arrangements to show all new colors of Brompton Place everywhere. So there we have it, Brompton Place. It's going to smash the competition. And by that, obviously, I mean, it needs to be better than- Retailer X. Well, I'm not gonna lie, this is a little bit awkward, but I suppose we could try. Well, I'm glad you're in. Uh, I'm gonna need you to focus first on customer analytics and acquisition. Um, and how we do that better than Retailer X. Can you come up with some kind of an activity that the guys in the room can get on board with and, and really generate some winning ideas? We'll try. Okay, amaze balls. I'll be in touch later on in the day to see how you're getting on, all right? All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Yes. All right. All right. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay, so that was fun. And as Vera hung up, the feeling of excitement in the room of people was palpable. They had no idea what had just really happened. But before the dust had settled, this happened. <laughs> oh my God. I like that film up, but... There you go. Oh, <laughs> Cheers, mate. Yeah, after Capital Rock. <laughs> Capital Rock. <laughs> The guy had brought a bag full of baseball caps and balloons, all with Brompton Place logos, and they were all handed out. This was it. Everyone in the room now worked for Brompton Place. Of course, in reality, Vera was a colleague of mine from IBM who had pre-recorded that video with me a few days before, and the delivery man was a colleague from IBM as well. But we then did some design thinking workshops, divergent thinking, that kind of thing. And we had a hugely productive few hours with Vera revisiting us twice to set slightly new briefs for the team. And we were getting literally hundreds of ideas for how Brompton Place could beat Retailer X in the market. And then for a final injection of the unexpected, Vera called me on the big screen for one last time, but she had bad news with the recent turbulence of Brexit, uh, she'd have to pull out of the Brompton Place purchase. But she did have some good news. She'd managed to get everyone their old jobs back at Retailer X. And so we flipped the boards and we spun the flower arrangements back to Retailer X logos. And the teams then had 30 minutes to prepare a pitch. They had to take their best Brompton Place idea and repurpose it for Retailer X. And their thinking was immense. They had unshackled their thinking. There were no constraints anymore. Their ideas were flowing. And I'm proud to say that a number of these ideas then went into development and production following the workshop. Now, I hope this example has been a bit fun and maybe given you some ideas into the power of immersive experiences. But what I really wanted to show you is where this idea came from in the first place. Why don't you all sit down? Uh, Donald, sit down, sit down. Right, here, here he comes. Well, here I come. <laughs> yes. 
Hello. <laughs> hello. Say hello. Say hello. Hello. How are you? Hello, John. Oh, yes. I've got lines here. Well, fine, fine, I guess. But uh, how did I get here? Uh, uh, well, let me show you. First, I'll need a drop of blood. Your blood. Right. <clears throat> oh, John, that hurt. Relax, John. It's all part of the miracle of cloning. Hello, John. Hello, John. <laughs> Hello. Hello, John. I'm from what? Hello, John. The law extraction has never recreated an intact Hello, DNA strain. Jurassic Park. Love that movie. I'd always wanted to do something after I'd seen that clip. Because ideas come from seeds and they come from experiences, inspirations, emotions. And so when you experience something that inspires you, collect it and write it down, scrapbook it for later. And don't feel bad about watching movies, or reading fiction or visiting exhibitions. If you're like me, you might have an annoying little voice in your head that says, don't watch a movie, go read a book about leadership and management instead. But know that if you open your mind, then anything that inspires you can be infinitely more powerful and applicable than a nonfiction book about business. And of course, the more inspiration that we immerse ourselves into, the more inspiration, the more resources, the more seeds of ideas we will have to choose from. Okay, so in summary, today I've talked through a few topics which are really the tip of the iceberg, but I do hope you found it valuable. And perhaps you might even try to put some of these techniques into place in your own jobs. But let's just have a quick recap. Number one, creativity is contagious. Surround yourselves with an environment and people and you will become more creative. Number two, practice divergent thinking. Find some exercises that force you and your team to think bigger and push yourself to the absurd because you never know what innovative ideas you will stumble across. Number three, Give your subconscious time and space. Let it do the work for you. Try harnessing the power of N1 sleep or get more exercise or take more showers. Number four, build in time for experimentation and play. Whilst it might seem like it is too much fun to be beneficial, it actually pays back in dividends. And number five, use your life experience no matter what you're inspired or impassioned by, use it, maximize it, involve it in your day today. And so that's it from me. If you want to keep the conversation going, I'd love to know whether any of these techniques work for you. So feel free to add me on uh, LinkedIn or, or TikTok or drop me an email. And I think we might have a couple of minutes for a, a question or two, Julie, if you're there. I am, Danny. Amazing. I'm really turbocharged now. Um, I'm looking <laughs> for my book to keep all my creative ideas. And uh, yeah, need to watch move, more movies by the sounds of it. So uh, right. superb, Danny. Thanks so much. Um, I really got a lot out of that. That was fantastic. Um, I suppose one question we've been asked is you talked about a lot about ways of working and different strategies, which I think we'll all be investigating more and, and hoping to imply into our day to day life. But what about sort of the culture within your team? You know, you mm. talked about contagious creativity. Are there any things that you do within the team that can sort of build on that that you'd want to share? Yeah, I, I think there's two things, really. The first one is the leadership of the team. So um, this is the most important thing for me. The team has to be given space and room and permission to make mistakes. That is the biggest thing. We cannot yeah. be creative yeah. in a blame culture. It just constrains everything. So leaders have to say, you're going to have time and space not only to be creative, without a brief, but to make a ton of mistakes because that's how we move forward. And then secondly, it's the uh, culture within the team as well. And, and I think what we've managed to do at IBM is to create a real community with peer-to-peer -peer sharing and almost uh, an admission of the hierarchical kind of seniority structure mm -hmm. in the business as well. I think when you're a group of creatives, you can try and forget that as much as possible. Great. 
Well, that's brilliant, Danny. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's been amazing. So I hope everyone will continue the conversation or go to networking after this to maybe have a chat with you. Um, can I just let everyone know um, there's a choice of track one where you can go and speak with Brand Folder. They're going to be discussing the art of creative reuse and repurposing or stay at track two uh, with the send share guys and make the most of what you are already have. So thanks ever so much guys and uh, have a good rest of the morning.